structures, if you will. It's going to be a four-chambered uh, component. It's going to have two superior structures called atriums, two inferior structures called ventricles. And then we're going to begin to look at the valves that separate those structures. We're going to talk about the movement of blood through those structures. So you're going to have these bold printed terms. We're going to show you illustrations here, and we're going to use our model to get comfortable with where all of this is. We're going to go through it, and then we're going to go through it again, and then we're going to go through it again, and then we're going to go through it again. So I would like to think repetition is going to get us there. We'll see. If you'll take the model that you have at your lab station, you can open it so that you actually have the same view that you're looking at up here. Take the front portion of the model off, and here we are seeing the four chambered regions. So if you'll look at the, the illustration that I have up here, I'm going to point out where our atriums are and where our ventricles are, and then you're going to find them. So the atriums are going to be the superior structures. So you have a right atrium and you have a left atrium. The ventricles will be the inferior structures. You have a left ventricle and a right ventricle. These are as they sit in your anatomy. So right is here, left is here. Take a moment. Let's see if you can find your right atrium in your model. If you don't think you've got it or you're not sure, please let me know. All right, everybody able to find the right atrium? All right, let's find the left atrium. Everybody think they're comfortable with where the left atrium is? Yes. Now, right ventricle, that will be inferior. It's going to be very small on your model. It's a tiny little thing here. This here? Yep, that is it. And left ventricle. All right, we think we know where those are at. Questions? Okay, so then let's move. What we're going to do now is we're going to look at the vascular structures that feed into and come out of the heart. So listed up here, you've got your superior and inferior vena cava, your pulmonary trunks, your pulmonary vein, and the aorta. So I'm gonna take this illustration, we're gonna go over each of those very slowly. This is what we call the inferior vena cava. This is the superior vena cava. Both of these come in and empty into the right atrium. See if you can find your superior and then inferior vena cava. <clears throat> we think we have them. I don't know what it's asked. Oh, yeah. Any questions? All right, so once that blood flows into the right atrium, it's going to move into the right ventricle. From the right ventricle, when the heart contracts, it's going to be driven up and out this structure that looks like a big T, and that is called the pulmonary trunk. See if you can find your pulmonary trunk. Can this be the pulmonary trunk? Yes, it is. All right, how are we doing? Now, that blood is going to go to the lungs. So the reason it tees is because one structure heads over to your right set of lobes, the other heads over to the left set of lobes of the lung. There, we're going to diffuse gases. We're going to pick up oxygen, saturate our blood with it, and drop off a little excess carbon dioxide. For that reason, the blood that we have just talked about moving through these structures and into the right atrium and right ventricle and out is what we refer to as deoxygenated blood. Now there's oxygen in there, but the levels are a little bit lower. When we look at deoxygenated blood, it typically appears a little darker in hue. We don't have as many O2 molecules on the hemoglobin. On the flip side, when we see oxygenated blood, it appears very vibrant red. And that's because the hemoglobin in the red blood cells is fairly well saturated with O2. Well, if I take that blood to the lungs, I pick up more oxygen, then I'm going to bring it back to the heart. And as I do so, I bring it back through these structures called pulmonary veins. All right, so please look at the pulmonary veins. 
You'll have to really look on the posterior side of the model of your heart to see them clearly. They will be red. Are we able to spot them? Pulmonary veins. You meaning these? Yep, that's one, and you'll have another on the opposite side. What about, what are these? Nope, that's, yeah. this is the pulmonary yeah, veins. Yeah, but what is this? That is where your pulmonary trunk is splitting as it goes over to the lungs on the right side. Oh, I see. Okay. All right, how are we doing? Good. Questions? All right, once those pulmonary veins empty into the left atrium, blood will eventually move into the left ventricle, and when the heart contracts, it will go out the aorta. It's a big structure. Let's see if we can find our aorta. Questions. All right. So what we've done now is we've looked at some of the vessels that are going to feed the heart and then take blood away from the heart. What we want to do now is we want to look at a set of valves that we're going to find that keep blood, please listen carefully, from going backward against the flow. So you're going to hear about two sets of valves that set between the atriums and the ventricles and we call those valves atrioventricular valves because they sit between the atriums and the ventricles. There are sometimes abbreviated AV valves. Then we're going to look at two more sets of valves that set on the vessels that leave the blood leaves in, leave the heart. And that's going to be the aorta and the pulmonary trunk. And those are called semi-lunar valves because of their shape. They look like a crescent moon when you see them from an angle. Now, the name of those valves is very simple. If you're looking in the pulmonary trunk, we call them pulmonary semilunar valves. If we're looking in the aorta, we call them aortic semilunar valves. All right, so their name should not be too tricky. So let's take a look at this illustration. Here's our right atrium. Here's our right ventricle. Here are the set of valves in an open position between the right atrium and the right ventricle. These are the right AV valves. Now, they have another name. They're called the tricuspids because there's three flaps to them, three pieces of the door, tricuspid. If we go over to the left-hand side and go from the left atrium to the left ventricle, these doors over here are called the left AV valves, but there's only two flaps to those. So we call them the bi Cuspid. They have another name. They're also known as the mitral valves. All right? So the valves that we said are going to be in the structures that allow blood to leave are going to be here in the pulmonary trunk. So here's a set of them called pulmonary semilunar valves. And here's the aorta, and there's the set that we find right there, aortic semilunar valves. Now what I want you to do is I want you to find the right atrioventricular valves or tricuspids on your models. Not all of you will have them. Some of them have been lost. Is it that? That's that. Yes. Everyone able to find those? On the left hand side you will have the bicuspid valves also called the left AV valves or the mitral valves. See if you can find those. Are you able to find them? Do you have them on the list? Are yours in there or are they missing? Yeah, they'll be there. Yes, have yours. Was pulmonary semilunar yes, valves and aortic semilunar valves? What was it? All right. It was pulmonary now, and aortic semilunar valves. The semilunar valves will be on your models because they're actually, the resin is poured in the mold. So if you look, here's the pulmonary semilunar valves. See if you can find those in your pulmonary trunk. You'll see the shape of them. Yep. And then see if you can find the aortic semilunar valves. All right, how are we doing? Questions? OK.
Okay, so what we've done now is we've looked at the valve structures that are sitting between the chambers of the heart and then between the heart and the vascular structures that exit. What you're about to do now is going to be the fun part here. We're going to look at the movement of blood through the heart and you're going to find that you have two circuits. So when we look at the movement of the blood, we're going to find that the right hand side of the heart is involved in one of those circuits and the left hand side of the heart the other. They are referred to as the pulmonary and systemic circuits respectively. Now we're going to follow the pathway of blood in these two circuits. You will have to know this. This will be probably a test question on your exam. So when I'm asking you about these two circuits, I'm going to use this illustration right here to kind of illustrate the circuits themselves. Do you notice the color over here is kind of a purplish blue? Okay, this is deoxygenated blood. So listen carefully. Blood comes back from the body's systems and it dumps into the right atrium. So the vena cava here takes all the blood from your upper extremities. The vena cava here, all the blood from your lower extremities. That blood comes into your right atrium. It will empty into your right ventricle. Your right ventricle is going to contract. Blood's going to go to your lungs. You're going to drop off carbon dioxide. You're going to pick up oxygen and you're going to bring the blood back through the pulmonary veins. Now guys, that is where we move deoxygenated blood to the lungs and back to the heart. All right? So it's the right side of the heart that moves blood to the lungs and back to the heart. That is called the pulmonary circulation. When we talk about individuals that are suffering from congestive heart failure, the pulmonary circuit is one of the areas we start to see problems in right away. Why? The blood is moving. Now, it's not a great distance, okay? It's coming from the heart up and into my lungs, but my blood pressure from that two locations is not very good, and the blood begins to pool in my lungs, and your patient will be short of breath. They are quite literally drowning in their own lungs because they can't get fluid off the alveolar sacs in their lungs and back to their heart. You'll see them. They'll huff, they'll puff, they'll have a hard time. That's pulmonary circuit failure. How are we doing? Okay. The second circuit is called systemic. If you listen to the name, it should make sense. So it's going to be on the left side of the heart. So now we take all this oxygenated blood from the left atrium to the left ventricle, out the aorta to all of the body systems, and we give up the oxygen and we bring back the carbon dioxide. So what are we doing? From the left side of the heart to the body systems and back to the heart. That's called systemic circulation. Systemic circulation is one that we quite easily can measure and see if we are having issues with it. We put a sphygmometer or a blood pressure cuff on our patient and we say, well, their pressure or their blood pressure, systolic and diastolic values, it's too low. The left side of their heart is not working well. All right, but that is systemic failure, not pulling. All right, how are we doing? So it goes right heart, lung, left heart, body? Left is systemic, right is pulmonary. So does the oxygen transfer from like the alveoli or, yeah, whenever like a cell takes up oxygen, like in the hemoglobin, does the uh, acidity of the, the blood itself have anything to yeah, do with it? Yeah, it'll shift. And you're going to learn that in your 205 class. We're going to talk about how as the carbon dioxide levels in our blood shift, if they get too high or too low, the pH of the blood will shift. And we're going to show you how that works, but that's 205. Okay. All right, how are we doing with the two circulations, pulmonary and systemic? Questions? All right. Now, what we want to do is we want to look at where the heart is in our body anatomy. So, let me ask you to go back to your lab sheets. Look at page 103. You said 103? 103 in your lab sheets. Do you see the first question? Which chamber of the heart pumps blood through the pulmonary circuit? Which chamber of the heart pumps blood through the systemic circuit? All right. Guys, let's think about this for just a minute. We can even go back to the illustration if we need to. 
We just went over the pulmonary and systemic circulation, right? Okay. Well, here's your chambers. Atriums, ventricles, right, left, right, left. If the atrium contracts, it's driving blood into the ventricles. But if the ventricles contract, they're driving blood either to the lungs or to the body systems. So look at that question and tell me which chamber pumps blood through the pulmonary circuit? The, pul the pulmonary is going where? To the lungs. So the right, um, not the ventricle, the right. Uh, Sorry. Like left and right. Atrium. Atrium goes into the ventricle. Oh, so it'd be the right ventricle. Yeah. Right ventricle goes to the lungs. Left ventricle goes where? To the body, body or systems. So your second one is which chamber of the heart pumps blood through the systemic circuit? So the body systems is going to be driven by the left side, the lungs by the right side. And it's not the atriums, it's the what? Ventricles. It's the ventricles. All right, how are we doing? Well, then, so the first one would be the right ventricle. What's that? The, the pulmonary circuit, that's the, the right ventricle. Uh-huh. Okay. And the systemic would be? The left ventricle. Very good. Now look at your second question. Which chambers are considered the receiving chambers of the heart? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So. If I have blood coming from the vena cava, they go into what? The atrium. And if I have it coming from the lungs, it goes into the other atrium. The other atrium, which we call the, the left atrium. Very good. All right, how are we doing with this? The atriums don't actually compress blood. Yeah, they do. They'll contract, but they're not as violent as the ventricles. The ventricles are really, they really push. Okay. Now, I want you to notice on page 100 of your lab sheets, it says examination of the heart model, all right? So we've been looking at the heart model. Now, if you look down that list, 22 structures, we have not covered all of those structures yet. You see the top where it talks about the base and the apex, coronary artery on the right side, coronary artery on the left side. These are some structures that we need to look at. So we're gonna go over a couple of slides here. And we're going to show you where these structures are. Now, if you remember, when we were in our first unit, we talked about the body cavities. We had the dorsal and ventral cavities. Does this ring a bell? And then we said the ventral cavities are the thoracic cavity and the abdominal pelvic cavity. And we said the thoracic cavity has our lungs and our heart. Does this ring a bell? Structures in it that are further subdivided. Well, now you're about to see one of those subdivisions. It's called the mediastinum. So our lungs are here, but there's a cavity right here called the mediastinum where we have connective tissue wrapping around our heart. That's going to be called the pericardium. And we're going to show it to you in a little more detail here in just a second. But when we look at the heart, it doesn't just sit here right in the middle. It's offset to the left. So I'm going to show you this illustration. Everybody take a peek up here. Here's your heart. And please notice, this is the apex. So that's the pointed tip of your heart. And this is the base. This is up here where the atriums are. Do you notice it's at an angle? And your apex is pointed like this. And your base is sitting like this. How are we doing? So the space that I'm seeing right here, this is the mediastinum. And these are pleural cavities with our lungs out here. All of this is the thoracic cavity. Well, I want you to get comfortable with the fact that the heart is not dead center. It is offset to the left. Now, depending upon what field of medicine you go in, some of you may eventually uh, run into what's called situs inversus. It's rare, but it does happen. There are people that have what we call mirror image organs. So instead of their heart being offset to the left, their heart is offset to the right. right. And instead of their liver being big here and wrapping around, it's big here and wraps around. And then we find their appendix over here instead of over, yeah. Wouldn't that be trippy if you're a general practitioner and somebody comes in and you're going, holy crap, I can't find the, yeah, shift over a little bit. Now, as you're looking at this illustration, you can see that cavity again. 
We're going to look at it in a little more detail here in just a second with the fibrous <coughs> and visceral parts of what we call the pericardium. But I'm going to see if you can answer a couple of questions with your lab partners before we do that. Take a minute, see how you're doing with this. The apex of the heart is centered in what anatomical direction? Left. Uh, explain how the pulmonary circuit and the systematic circuit differ. Specify the, the beginning and end points of each circuit. First, we can just say the pulmonary is the long system. Systematic goes underground. Yeah. Do you want us to like point it out on the? The deoxygenated, okay, so the pulmonary is deoxygenated blood from the right side. So it would be the ventricle on the uh, left side, I think, that receives oxygenated blood because that's when it comes back from the lungs. Yeah. Well, wait. I could be wrong. I thought it was. I don't know. Um, is it the left, um, what's it called? Atrium that receives <coughs> the oxygenated blood, right? Exactly. Okay. So we said the atrium to the left atrium is the one that receives oxygenated blood. So the function of the valves in the heart to carry the blood and pump the heart. Oh, what side of the heart? The left atrium, is that what you're saying? Yes. Okay, never mind. Sorry. I was confused by the question and I was like, I don't know if I'm answering this right. No, I, that's not a yeah. Is that what function of the valves has in the heart? Um, it pulmonary. That's I know. That's like the hardest question there is. All right, how are we doing? Okay. Anything giving us difficulty here? Excellent. I love the feedback. I have a question. Yes. Uh, it's a bit off topic, but these little veins here. Yep. Are we going to go over those? Yep. Okay. We are. All right, how did you do with these questions? Okay, so here we go. I wanted to look at that sac that we said surrounds the heart. It's going to be called a pericardium. And when we talked about serous membranes at the beginning of the semester, we gave you the illustration of a balloon, and you put your fist in a balloon, and so you had the part of the balloon that touched your hand, and then you had the, the gaseous space, and then you had the outer part of the balloon. Well, you're about to see that analogy really clearly here. The fibrous pericardium is the outside region of the sac that surrounds the heart. Then you have the visceral pericardium that's on the surface of the heart. Then you have the space in between, which is the pericardial space cavity, if you will, and there's a fluid in there. And that fluid is called serous fluid. That's what you see right here. Here's an illustration of what we're describing. So here's your heart, and out here is the fibrous part that covers it, and it comes all the way down here to the diaphragm and attaches to your diaphragm, comes back up and then folds in on itself. Then there's the visceral part that's on the wall of the heart, and then there's the space in between the two and the fluid. Yes, sir? Is that the same serious fluid that we talked about in chapter 30? Uh-huh. Sure. Now, here's the deal. When I'm looking at a heart, I don't know how many of you have or have not seen. Are you talking about, say that again. I want to make sure I answer your question. I first. said the, I didn't know what chapter was in, but I was just wondering if that was the same serious fluid we were talking about previous chapter. Yes. When we were looking at the serous membranes, this is it. In chapter 28, I think? Well, we should have talked about it in one or two, somewhere in there. One, I think it was in one, but Okay. If I'm looking at this sac surrounding the heart, I can see the heart underneath it, but it's not transparent, all right? If you've ever seen an open heart surgery, it will, you won't forget it. When we open the heart, when we open the thoracic cavity and see the heart and it's beating, it looks like it's gonna come out there and get you. I mean, it's moving, it's violent. It's quite a bit of contraction. So it's going to compress, contract, and drive blood, and then relax and open up. And it's, it's quite literally looking like it's bouncing in your chest. 
Well, that's a lot of movement. And so that sac is protecting the other organs around the heart, like the lungs, and it's protecting the heart so that every time it contracts and relaxes, it's rubbing on the two parts of the sac, but there's a fluid in there. And that fluid reduces the friction. Well, there's a problem. Sometimes some disease states can lead to inflammation of these pericardial membranes. And as they become inflamed, they swell. And then there's not enough fluid, or worse yet, there's too much fluid in that space. And if that occurs, if we get too much fluid in that space, then when the heart contracts, it cannot relax and open up to its original size. And it just gets pressed and pressed and pressed until the volume of blood being ejected is smaller and smaller and smaller with each heartbeat. This is called pericarditis. It's a very dangerous condition. When we listen to the heart and someone is suffering from this, you'll hear it. You can listen to the love dub sounds of the heart, but it will sound like in there somebody has wrapped foil around it and you'll hear this crackling. And cardiac tamponade, this condition has to be taken care of pretty quickly. We have to go in with a syringe, we go into the pericardial cavity, and we draw off the fluid so that the heart can start to beat more efficiently. Yeah, it's fun to watch. <clears throat> All right, how are we doing with the understanding of that pericardial membrane and its importance? Yes, sir. So is that cirrhosis fluid, is that like the, what they're talking about, like chapter 30 and chapter 20, are you talking, like, is that the same fluid that's in the joints? Like, no, that's synovial fluid. So what other body system has serous fluid in it? So if I look at the pleural cavities where the lungs are, you'll see that soon. You're going to see serous fluid. If we look in the abdominal pelvic cavity in spaces that we call, I'm trying to remember the term for it here. Uh, yeah, it's slipping me. We have spaces between the abdominal pelvic organs and we have those mesenteries that cover it. There'll be some fluid in there that is serous of nature. It is more aqueous or water-like. All right, but it has some, if you will, lipid base to it, so it's just slippery enough that you get movement. Okay. So what happens if you don't have enough of the serious fluid in the heart and it, that doesn't protect? You'll it? start to get friction in there, and it will irritate the linings. They'll swell, and you get to this cardiac tamponade. Okay, so if you have less, too then much it, or not enough, either one or not good. Yeah. So the same thing will happen if you have too little. It'll start to too swell. little. You can get to that point where you start to get inflammation of those membranes. Okay. Yep. I can't imagine doing open heart surgery, cutting through that, and then putting yeah. it back. Yep. They use, it's really cool if you've never seen it, they have a substance now, it looks like a, like a gel foam. It's the only way I'd describe it. And they'll come right on top of it with this thin layer of that material. They'll have fine sutures in the fibrous. They'll put the gel foam over it, the gel foam reduces the leakage, and then the fibrous connective tissue, it will close, yeah, and then the gel foam, the body will basically reabsorb. Slick stuff. What happens if it leaks out into the rest of your body? Well, typically, it, I mean, they get pretty tight with the sutures. It doesn't, but the gel foam keeps it mm -hmm. from leaking out. Think of it like putting a, a pretty rigid sponge over something. So if the fluid does start to come up, it stays right there. It doesn't seep into the spaces. Okay. All right. Other questions? So then let's get to these other external physical structures that are listed in your lab sheet that we're going to see on our model right now. Let's go ahead and take your model, put the front or anterior piece back on, and we're going to look at these guys right here called oracles. When we're looking at the external anatomy of your heart, where the atriums are, the walls are really thin. And so when the atriums fill, they kind of expand out. And then when the atriums contract, they kind of collapse down. They look like flaxid, excuse me, flaccid, myxomenous. Think of it like an elephant's ear. They just kind of flop down. That's an oracle. And that's what is showing when we look at the external structure where the um, atriums are. Well. Here are the other big structures that we're going to see from the external view. You're going to see the pulmonary arteries. You're going to see the pulmonary veins. You're going to see the trunk, the aorta, both ascending and descending. You're going to see these depressions where the blood vessels are running along the surface of the heart. 
and we call these sulci. So you're going to hear about these coronary sulci, interventricular sulci. There are some on the front, there are some on the back. So we call them anterior interventricular sulci or posterior interventricular sulci. It's much easier to see them and go over them than it is for me to give you the terms, but you have the terms. So now let's look at them stru uh, structurally and let's look at them on your model. So those flappy, flaccid structures where the atriums are, that's these guys right here, these are called oracles. So this is the right oracle, this is the left oracle. This is where your atrium is. When you dissect your heart here shortly, you're gonna spot these guys. Now they're gonna be hard and rigid because of the preservative in the muscle, but if you had a living heart, you could just kind of pick them up and they take up some space and then you could drop them and they just flap down, all right? Find your right and left oracle. <coughs> so you said the sulky or sulci? Isn't that also a part of the brain? Say that again, sulci? Yeah, sulci is a term that we use to describe areas that depress or go in, Okay. A recess. I was like, we went over the yeah. brain and there was a soul guy in there. Somewhere. Exactly, but what you're really using is terminology that describes the physical appearance. Okay. Does that help? Yes, because the soul guy, is, it's, that's on like the back part of the brain. The soul guy is in between, when we were looking at the cerebrum and it looked like hamburger, Yes. the little depressions in the hamburger, the little lines, that's mm -hmm. the soul guy. Okay, got it. All right, how are we doing with our oracles? Able to spot them. Now let's take a look at this. Here's the aorta, here's the pulmonary trunk, here's your superior and inferior vena cava. Now I want you to notice coming underneath the oracles and wrapping around, you have this little area where you're gonna find vascular structures. This is where it be some of our coronary arteries and veins. And they're in this depressed location of the heart called the coronary sulcus. Everybody see this right here? This is the right coronary sulcus, and where it wraps around on the opposite side, guess what? It's called the left coronary left sulcus. Coronary. So how are we doing with that? Everybody okay? Find the right and left, if you will, coronary sulcus on your models. Do you spell sulcus? <laughs> All right. Everybody okay with that? When you dissect your heart here in a little bit, it will depend upon how much fat or adipose is on your heart as to whether you will see these areas clearly or not. Some of you may, some of you may not. Depends on how chubby your cow was, all right? Oh, I thought it was a pig heart. Now, please notice the vessels come down on the heart, both on the posterior and the anterior side of the heart. The anterior side is called the anterior interventricular sulcus, and on the posterior side, we call it the posterior interventricular sulcus. So if I flip the view to the posterior side, there's your posterior interventricular sulcus. There's your anterior. Now, see if you can find those, please. You said, oh, so it's here and here? Yeah. Wait, that's the same side. How can we do? I, is, are you talking about uh, this and this? Okay, I'm going to flip the view. So here's your first one, anterior, and then here is your second one right here, posterior. Okay, okay yeah, so it would be this one, this crease. Good. All right, now let me explain something. When you're looking at your heart, and again, we haven't dissected, let's say, your heart and it's open, these are landmarks that tell you where your structures are internally. You can look at this and you know, well, my right atrium is under that. And you know your left atrium is inside there. But you see this guy right here? It actually comes very close to dividing the right ventricle from the left ventricle. So it's a nice little landmark to kind of give you an idea of where you're at when you're looking at external structure. All right, how are we doing? Questions? Now, today, when you dissect, really, really pay attention to this, please, because it's going to be something that will give you trouble. You're not probably going to see these guys. That's the superior, that's the inferior vena cava. Because when they cut these and they cull the cattle, they typically cut these guys like right here, so they make one big just incision. And you can't tell where the superior and the inferior came in, even though you're going to be looking for those structures, all right? Also on the posterior side, here's the pulmonary veins. That's where the blood is coming back from the lungs into the left atrium. Many times, they'll just cut this whole area right here. You won't see those larger veins. You'll just see a big open space where they would have emptied in from the two sides, okay? Question? 
All right. So I have a few questions for you. We'll see how you guys do with this. The sulky. Sulky. Or the culinary artery. This most superficial layer of the surface is sad. So, when we were looking at this illustration right here, you see that guy right there? And then a superficial layer of pericardial sac goes back to this illustration right here. So there's the outer. The fibrous. Right there, that's the fibrous, and the inner is the visceral. Did it feel the same? No. Yeah, another wraparound. Too much pericardial fluid causes the heart to stop. Well, it compresses the heart more and more. If, on the last question, it asked what the risk would be. There's too much of heart to smash it because you can't breathe. All right, questions? How'd you guys do with these? Good. Excellent, excellent. Thank you for the feedback. All right, so. So welcome. Let's get to some information on the side. We need to talk about the circulation of blood to the heart. But before we do a couple of really big things, you're going to see this when you dissect here in just a little bit. I want you to make sure that it sticks. It, it kind of is something that you remember. When you dissect your heart, you're not going to dissect it like this. Please don't. That would be butchering it. All right, but if we were to cut this, this is what we would see. Here's the wall of the right ventricle. Here's the wall of the left ventricle. The two ventricles hold a similar volume of blood. Why is the left ventricle so much thicker than the right ventricle? Now let's go back to our circulation. Where does the blood go from the right ventricle? Into? The lungs. How far away is that? It's right here. Do I need a lot of pressure to do that? No. No. Where does the blood from the left ventricle go? Uh, the whole Everywhere. body. The whole body systems. So I need greater force to get that blood over a larger area. Everybody okay with that? We're going to show you some structures here in a few minutes that are involved in training, if you will, your left ventricle to be so much bigger. It's like Popeye. You got this big massive bicep over here and this little scrawny thing over here. All right? But there's a reason for it. We're going to look at the muscle of the heart wall. It is what we call the myocardium. So these terms tell you real quickly what you're looking at. Epi is outside, endo is inside. Myocardium is the muscle. So the outer portion of it is a thin layer, if you will, of epithelial tissue. The inner is a thin layer of epithelial tissue. Here they are. This is the epithelial tissue, epicardium. Some fat in there, some blood vessels. Here's the muscle, big and deep and thick. You're about to find out here in a few minutes just how thick this is because you're not going to cut your cow's heart with a scalpel. You would be cutting all day. It takes something much bigger to cut through this sucker. All right. And then the inner, if you will, endothelium is again a very thin layer of epithelial tissue. Now, I'm not going to test you over this, but it's, a, it's important information to you. I think it helps explain that left and right ventricle thing to you. We're going to look at some very important structures, and this fossa ovalis and the foramen ovalis is going to be one here in a second. Now this, the septums, yeah, you better know these. So we're going to have the trabeculae carnae, the papillary muscle, the chordae tendinae, those, those two septums that I told you about, they're going to be in here. And you're going to be able to identify them because what did I tell you is going to be on your test next week. You're going to have a diagram of the heart. You see this right here? You're going to see this on your test. All right? Now, we've gone over structure a few times. We're going to go over it again here. You guys ready? Let's see if you can tell me what you've learned. This is the inferior vena cava. This is the superior vena cava. Where do they empty? Into the right atrium. Blood from the right atrium is going to go into the right ventricle. When the right ventricle contracts, blood is going to go out the lung. To the lungs. Going to them, but goes out what structure? The pulmonary. Pulmonary 
something? Trunk. Pulmonary trunk. And then these guys are called pulmonary arteries. They go to the lungs, all right? And then I'm going to do what? I'm going to pick up oxygen and get rid of carbon dioxide, all right? This side of the heart, the right side of the heart, handles what circuit was it again? Pulmonary circuit, right. Now that blood in the lungs is going to come back by a pulmonary set of veins. And they're going to go into what area? Left atrium. Which is going to empty into the? Left ventricle. Which is going to go out the? Aorta. Which is going to go to the body system and then come back. That's what circuit? Uh, systemic. That's your systemic circuit. Now, you'll notice this is, we're going multiple times over this, right? Okay. So here's what I want to do. I want to look at everything again, but I'm going to show you those terms that you just saw on the slides that are going to be important to you that could be on your test. You've got to know everything we just went over. So you need to know your right atrium, left atrium, right ventricle, left ventricle. You need to know your aorta, your superior and inferior vena cava, your pulmonary trunk, your pulmonary veins. We've already gone over those. All right. We even went over this. What do we say those valves are between the atriums and the ventricle? Yes, I do. The, um, Between oh. the atriums and the friggin' ventricles. Come on. AV valves. Atrioventricular valves. Right. And if they're on the right side, we call them right AV valves. If they're over here on the left side, we call them left AV valves. Yeah. And over here, there's three pieces to the door. So we could also call it the tricuspid. Good. And over here, there's only two flaps to the door, so we could call it the bicuspid, bicuspid good, or also known as the mitral valve. Don't let that one get you. Could be there. Mitral valve. So we said when the blood goes out the ventricles through the pulmonary trunk or out through the aorta, we've got to pass through another set of valves. They're kind of shaped like little crescent moons. Um, so if we go out the pulmonary trunk, what valves are those we're passing through right there? Pulmonary semilunar. Exactly, pulmonary semilunar valves. If we go out the aorta, we're going to go through the aortic semilunar valves. Right. Again, that is stuff we've already covered. Here's where the terms are that we just looked at on those slides. So, not too tough, but if I'm looking at the two atriums, when I dissect my heart here in a minute, I'm going to find that the atriums are not open to each other. There's a wall between those two atriums. Now, there is a term that we use to describe a wall. It's called a septum. All right, so if I have a wall between the two atriums, we call it an interatrial septum. You'll notice here, this is the right ventricle, this is the left ventricle, there's a wall between the two. So if I have a wall between the two ventricles, we call it interventricular septum. Septum's a wall. Everybody okay with that? So those were some of the terms that we had. Now, here's where some of the terms were that you're going to get a little bit of additional information on that I'm not going to hammer on you, but I really think it's important for you to know the developmental reasons for it. Here's the wall of the atrium. This little guy right here is a depression. In the wall over here on the right side, we can see it a little bit on the left, but more so on the right. It's called the fossa ovalis. Fossa is a depression. Ovalis is in oval. What is this? Well, when you're in the womb, that's not a depression, that's an opening, and it's called the foramen ovale. I'm going to say that one more time. When you're in the womb, you have a hole in your atriums. You don't have to worry about your lungs working, which is a good thing, because they aren't working when you're in the womb. As a matter of fact, they're the last thing to develop. Mom's giving you all the oxygen you need. It's coming across the placenta and right through the cord. So you're not doing gas exchange in your lungs. All the blood in your body is fully oxygenated. Mom gets all the carbon dioxide. Little leech. So when you look at that wall, think about this for a minute. Every time the atriums contract, residual blood from the right actually gets pushed over into the left atrium. And then that goes into the left ventricle and then out the aorta. Well, that means the left side of my heart is probably working a little harder when I'm in the womb than the right. And you'd be exactly right. Well, back to Popeye. If you sit here and you use your 100-pound dumbbell and do curls all day long, and over here you take your 12-ounce Bud Light, you tell me which one of these guys is going to look different after about a year of that. You're going to be much bigger over here, right? You're also going to have cirrhosis. But anyway, you're going to be much bigger over here. 
What's happening? Well, when you're in the womb, you're driving more blood over here, forcing the left ventricle to work harder by virtue of volume. That's not where it stops. <coughs> now, here's another structure you won't get tested over. This is called ligamentum arteriosum. Everybody see it? This looks like a little piece of ligamentous tissue. If you look at an adult, it would look exactly like that. But if you look at a fetus in development, it's actually an open vascular structure. Every time blood is pushed out the pulmonary trunk, that blood, part of it, in volume, goes into the aorta, which then goes into the body system, which again causes the left side of the heart to do what? Work harder, so that the wall gets thicker. How are we doing? Okay, so we've talked about the two walls, the inner atrial septum, the inner ventricular septum. Now here's the last of the terms that we just showed you a moment ago that you've got to know structural-wise. Here's those valves. You guys see them again? This is what set of valves? The right? AD or tricuspid, right? What is this one over here? The left bicuspid. Okay. So every time your ventricle contracts, it's going to take blood and it's going to shove it in this direction. You're going to find that blood, so this is the apex of your heart, blood is going to go just like this. That's how your heart contracts. So it's forcing it back towards the base. As it forces it in this direction and this direction, those AV valves, the blood gets caught behind them and they get pushed in this direction and they close. But the force is great enough that it could very easily take those valves and they could invert or what we call prolapse. But they don't. And here's why they don't. Because attached to the ends of those little doors are these tiny little cords called cordae tendinae. And those little cords, you'll notice, come down here and they attach to the wall of the ventricle, but the wall of the ventricle where they attach kind of pinches up, nipples up, if you will. And those cords attached to the end of those nipples, well, that's muscle, that's cardiac muscle in there. So when the ventricle contracts to push the blood, guess what those little papillary muscles are doing? They're taut, they're tight, they're holding. And so as the valve starts to do this, the cordae hold so that it doesn't do what? invert or prolapse, all right? So we need to know these chordae tendinae and these little papillary muscles. All right, questions? So what happens if they don't work like they're supposed to? Well, if those valves collapse back in, we have what is called a prolapse. That's a problem. Now the blood's going in the wrong direction. There's going to be a drop in pressure in the body systems or in the pulmonary circuit. Both of those things would be bad. So we sometimes have to go in there and repair the valves or replace them. Neither one of those are things that we'd like to do. Here's pretty pictures of those valves. There's the right AV or tricuspid, left AV or bicuspid. There's the semi lunars we see them from a superior view. Here's that illustration of the valves being forced closed or forced open and then closing when the blood moves back. Why would the blood move back? Well, look again at this illustration. This is the way the cardiac muscle is arranged in the heart. You'll notice it's not a set of striations that go down like this, it's wrapped around. And that's because up here at the top, where the atriums are at, the design is to take the atriums and like squeeze them out to push the blood into the ventricles. And the design down here on the ventricles, as you can see from that pattern, is to take the blood and do what? Push it up towards the base. So the blood will then go out. Now, if all of that works, we should get body system blood that's highly oxygenated and pulmonary circuit blood that's going to have the CO2 ready for exchange that we need. Everything should be working good. But remember, the heart is a muscle itself, so it's got to have some blood that's oxygenated, and it's probably going to have some blood that's going to get carbon dioxide in it. So we want to look briefly at how we feed the heart and then take that blood back. This is the coronary circulation itself. Now, don't panic. I'm not going to ask you to know all of the different branches of the coronary arteries or all of the different branches of the coronary veins, but I do want you to see how they work and know about the big branches. All right, so here they are. This is your right atrium. This is your left atrium. This is your right ventricle. This is your left ventricle. These two guys right here and right here are your two coronary arteries, big boys. Right coronary artery wraps around like this. Left coronary artery wraps around like this. You've already seen those when you looked at your model. All right, so you have a right and you have a left. This is where students, though, get some confusion thrown into the mix. So 
Left side of the heart is driving oxygenated blood out. Follow me. Left ventricle out the aorta to the body systems. When that happens, students go, oh, so when the heart contracts, it's driving blood out here to the heart itself. No. No. It doesn't. It's when the heart relaxes. That's tricky. So when the heart relaxes, that left ventricle and the right ventricle at the same time open. And when they open, they create negative pressure. And the blood in the aorta wants to come back here and empty. But remember those semilunar valves? They're right here and they say, no, you're not doing that. And that means all that blood pulls right in there. And guess what? Then it moves in to the right branch. And then it moves in to the left branch and feeds the heart. How are we doing? Yep. So the negative pressure just pulls the blood that sits on top of the valves? Into the heart. Cool. Exactly. Now, if we're doing all this exchange, we're going to take some CO2 back, and we do. And this is how we do it. This is different looking than what you just saw. You'll notice we don't have two branches. We have just one big guy right here. So the blood's coming back in this direction. And you'll notice it comes back through this great cardiac vein from this side. And it comes around from this smaller cardiac vein from this side. That's real tough. Great, big, small, small. All right, and they empty in one location back here on the right atrium. And what do we say the right side of the heart has? Deoxygenated blood. And this is where it comes back in and empties. All right, how are we doing? So when we talk about bypasses, guys, what we're talking about is somewhere typically in this group of arteries that you see, we have blockage. And we have to bypass it and get around it. And that means when you hear about a, a quadruple bypass, we're bypassing in four different areas somewhere along this pathway. That's not good. All right, we don't like to do that. Okay? All right, some questions for you. Take a moment, see how you do with this. How are the walls my surgical different? How are the walls in these different legs? Um, well, the left one is thicker because it's pushing all the stuff to the rest of the body. The right one is thinner because it doesn't have to. And it only has to go to the lungs. And it also makes sense because the left or the right one, if the lungs are the last thing to develop before you come out of the world, it makes sense that the wall is thinner in a way. Right. So, um, because it doesn't have to do anything. Yeah, exactly. Oh. Oh, what they, those are called. Um, they're like the little ligament thingies that keep the valves from going the wrong direction. But they also connect the different parts of the heart. Yeah, they're the, I think they're the ligaments. Like, I don't know what they're called, though. I'm That's going to bother me. Which one? So, when we were looking at this illustration right here, the inner atrial septum is the wall between the two atrials. Tendidious cord. I'm asking you what was that structure that allowed ketal blood to move Tendidious over. Tendidious cord. And that's that fossil balance right there. Okay. And then the fourth question that you had was the right and left corner of the artery receives blood from. So let's see here. Here's the right or here's the left. The blood's coming back and emptying into those from the <laughs> Which opening in the interstitial heart connects the right and left? Oh, they just were talking about the fourth question. These words getting them all confused. 
to watch the video later. Just a couple. Is it not? Or? It's atrium, right and left atrium, so I think it's this thing here. <laughs> Yeah, I'm not going to hit you on that. I'm going to jump out of the All right. Anybody got questions about any of these? Yep. What are those things of the last one? The right and left coronary arteries. Yeah. So here's the right, here's the left. They're fed by the aorta. Oh, okay. So just the. Uh, is it. What's the valve that regulates the aorta? Is it just the aortic valve? Aortic semilunar valve keeps it closed. Okay, so that's where it gets it from. The aortic semilunar valve. Keeps the aorta from having blood go back into the left ventricle. Okay, now let's take a look at your lab sheet on page 103 again. <laughs> So you've got a couple more questions here. I want you to look at number three. <clears throat> I want to help you with this a little bit. We're going to look at veins and arteries and unit four uh, when we come back. But this one uh, is a little bit of a piece of information I wanted you to get before we even got to that point. Students frequently hear about arteries and veins, and they have this visual. If they, they are working with a, an anatomy textbook, every time they see an artery, it looks red, and every time they see a vein, it looks blue. And so if I ask you, you know, what's moving in arteries, most of the students would go, well, that's the oxygenated blood. And if I ask you what's moving in the veins, you go, well, that's the deoxygenated blood. Well, yeah, most of the time. <laughs> but that's not really what arteries are. So listen carefully, I'm gonna say it nice and slow. Arteries are structures that carry blood away from the heart. Arteries are structures that carry blood away from the heart. Veins are structures that carry blood to the heart. Veins are structures that carry blood to the heart. Most of the time, that means arteries are carrying oxygenated blood, and most of the time, veins are carrying deoxygenated blood. But look up here. I'm going to show you an illustration of the heart, and you're going to go, ooh. So you see this guy right here? It's the pulmonary trunk. It's going to come up, and it's going to branch, and you're going to go to the right and left side of the lungs, and as it does, those are going to be called pulmonary arteries. Why? Because they're carrying blood away from the heart. What did we say that blood is if it's coming from the right side of the heart? It's deoxygenated. Now check this out. You see these guys right here carrying blood back into the left atrium? You see what color they are. They're going into the left side because they're coming back from the lungs. What do they have in them? Lots of oxygen. So look at your question number three. Can an artery carry deoxygenated blood? Yes, but arteries are mostly just structures that carry blood away from exactly. the heart. Exactly, but in this case, the pulmonary arteries are carrying what? Deoxygenated blood. Everybody okay with that? Okay. Now, we went over the cordae tendine. We showed you those. You guys see them up here. The cordae are holding the AV valves. They're keeping the AV valves from doing what again? So if that's them right here. We don't want those AV valves doing what? Prolapsing. We want them to close. So yeah, they prevent prolapse. And then number five, what structure does blood pass through on the way from the superior vena cava? 
to the pulmonary trunk. Well, that one's going to be a little more elaborate. So here's the superior vena cava. We're going to go in the right, right atrium, trim. through the right AVs, into the right ventricle, and out the pulmonary semilunar valves, and then into the pulmonary trunk. So they're wanting you to be able to show that you can trace the pathway of blood and you recognize the physical structures of the heart. So I'm going to give you a few minutes to answer those questions. And we have gone over all the structures that were on page 100 on the model of your heart, which means it's time for us now to, to look at another heart, which means it'll be time for us to dissect here in a minute. So you guys finish those questions.